Hello and welcome to CG Radio, everybody. I am your host, Cable Guy. How is everybody today out there in Radio Land? I am well, as I hope you are. So for today's guest on the podcast, I have the actor Steve Rivas, who is very well known in the Western movie genre, but many, many of you would know him from the more contemporary movie Fargo, where he starred alongside William H. Macy and Steve Buscemi. He played the very memorable Shep Proudfoot, the mechanic who goes in and beats the shit out of Ishimi towards the end of the movie, therefore immortalizing him in movie history. So, without further ado, let's get Steve on the horn. Yeah, hello. Hi, Steve. How's it going? It's Cable Guy. What's up, buddy? Uh, the library, they gave me a small uh, enclosed room, which is nice, you know, because it's quiet. Right, right, right on. Okay. Okay, well, first off, let me take this opportunity to thank you for coming on my podcast. I really appreciate it. It took a little while to track you down, and I appreciate everybody who helped me get in touch with you. And uh, I wouldn't, would you mind having a little conversation with us about your career and uh, on uh, – your time, like on the movie Fargo, where most people would remember you as the memorable Shep Proudfoot. Uh huh. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, are you are you on now? Is it live right now? Uh, I mean, are we gonna do? Oh uh, well, we're recording. We we're, do... we're we're recording right now. So. Oh okay. So you just want me to uh, answer the. Uh, well, yeah, but uh, we're 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 gonna start at the we're gonna start at the beginning and we're gonna get to Fargo and like the missing and all that in a little bit. Okay, um, yeah, the, um, the main thing is just ask me, you know, like, you know, how, how was it working on Fargo and okay, okay. do you have any interest in any other, any other films or, you know, how I got started, all this. Okay, all this whole well, well, okay, well, let's start at the very beginning. How was it that you decided to get into acting? Well, I didn't um, pursue acting. I was uh, working at a Phillips 66 in Lawrence, Kansas. Mm-hmm. And I uh, had a two-week vacation, and I went home to uh, uh, my tribe up in Browning, Montana, and they were doing a film called War Party. Okay. And so uh, my brother my brother and I, we went down, and he said, uh, let's go audition. So we auditioned, and uh, they didn't have any parts. So they wanted riders, horseback riders for the lead actors, and I doubled the lead actor, and Mm-hmm. And so I didn't really pursue the film at that time, and um, and I got you know I just got interested in it and uh, just went from there. Okay, okay. So did you have to really pursue your uh, role for your part in Fargo, or did that sort of just fall into your lap one day? Um, well, on Fargo, I have I have an agency, GVA. Okay. Uh, which I still. Uh, have that agency and they got me an audition and I went audition then later on I met with the Cohen brothers okay and they liked uh, you know they liked uh, the performance I had done and that's how I was able to get that role okay okay but again again I was you know auditioning okay are the Cohen bro- brothers fun to work with uh yeah well you know they're they're kind of different. Joel, he's more serious, and Ethan, he's really he always gets excited, you know, when he sees a scene and he really likes it. And uh, but they're, you know, they're they really know their craft, and I've never uh, been directed by uh, two directors at the same time. Even though Joel is the director, you know, Ethan is right there. So it was a it was a good experience to work uh, with those guys, and. Uh, I did. I think I worked just two days out of that. Uh, one was uh, where we were in the uh, uh, the shop doing uh, mechanic work, mm-hmm. and the other one is where you know was in the uh, motel or the hotel where you know I end up getting violent with uh, Steve Buscemi. Oh, okay. Oh. That was kind of yeah. That was that. That was something I never did before. <laughs> right. Well, that I'd have to say that scene pretty much immortalized you in movie history. Okay, and, and that just that really probably is what set the definition of what the word being sunned is. Okay, you know, because that's the only person you should ever really beat like that when they really messed up. They say, but but they, 
Now, here's an urban legend that's been going around for years and years and years, and maybe you could finally help settle it, okay? Before that memorable scene which immortalized you in history, okay, there's this urban legend going around that before you did the scene, they had you take seven shots of whiskey and have Bashimi fuck with you just to kind of rile you up so you seem genuinely angry in the scene. And you did seem – like, I've only seen that look of rage in a man's eyes, like, maybe, like, twice in my life, okay? Where you just you – de you definitely sold and were very convincing in that scene that Shep was not a happy camper. Yeah. Um, so the question was is that he kind of – before the scene, he kind of uh... – Work with me, or is that what you're saying? No, uh, before yeah, I mean, before this before the scene, did they have you take a few shots of whiskey and have Bashimi like start like messing with you, trying to get you angry before the scene? Is that true, or is that just an urban no, that's, legend? That's an urban legend. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that's funny. Well, that's well, you just ended a a, a twenty something year legend, so. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I I don't know what I would have done if I was on whiskey, you know, Indians and whiskey they you don't know, mix. <laughs> so it, it was just you know just something I it was just one of those scenes that um, Joel had told me you know this is your hotel room it's not Steve Buscemi's hotel room but since he knows where your hotel room uh, is. Mm -hmm. You catch him with this woman, and you're in rage already because of, he's getting you involved with, you know, uh, what they're doing, uh, you know, kidnapping the woman and that. And I had been in prison with them mm -hmm. before, with Ibu Shemi before. Mm -hmm. he said, so along with him uh, in your room with a woman, you're, in, you're already uh, very angry because uh, – He's kind of gotten you involved, and he said, so just look at it at that point and, and just, you know, just do what you need to do. And so I just, you know, focused on that, and, and it just came out, you know, once, you know, I went into the room, you know, I just, just kind of, I just played it as real as possible. And so uh, it, I guess it, it showed on screen. <laughs> right. Oh, yes, it was. Very, very, very convincing. Yeah, that's, you know, that, or, see, I tried to get a whole trend go going about how if someone got beat like that, you just got shut proud-footed. And, you, yeah. know, you know, maybe. And it, I think, you know, the thing about it is that is the only film that people recognize me, uh, you know, like when I'm walking down the street, especially in Los Angeles. Right. That's the only one that people out of the blue recognize me. Right. And, uh. Uh, you know, they come up and, of course, they're, they're excited. And uh, and the other one that I've been recognized on was uh, uh, doing a role about was uh, The Longest Jar with uh, Adam Sandler. Oh, yeah, yeah, I like that movie. Huh? I like that movie. Oh, yeah, I, well, I played um, Babyface Bob. I don't know if you knew that. And it, I was in the... Uh, in the booth with uh, uh, Chris Berman, and at one point there was another scene where I, uh, Adam Sandler hits me over the head with a plate, and that kind of starts a riot. Okay. So that's the only two uh, roles that I've ever been um, recognized, you know, off the street of, they didn't, of people just coming up to me. They so didn't. That's pretty. They didn't recognize you for your work in the messing, because you know I remember you quite vividly from that uh -huh. movie. Yeah, no, not really. I don't think people really um, recognize me with those, uh, you know, those, like the 1800, 1800 movies. Right, it's right. More than, you know, the contemporary movies. Right, so, right. There's not a whole lot of people that watch Westerns, I, is what I've found. You know, they're more more into the, the contemporary movies, so that's how I, I think, you know, that's why I'm not really recognized. In the missing and uh, Geronimo, which was another big film with um, uh, Walter Hill. Right, right. Yeah, wasn't was that wasn't that a made for TV movie? Uh, Geronimo. Yeah, or was that released in no, the theater? That, there, there were two Geronimos that came out at the same time. Excuse me. 
One was uh, Geronimo, an American legend. That was with uh, uh, Gene Hackman and Robert DeVoe. They were the big names. Okay. And uh, let's see, I forget the lead actor's name right now. That's just been so long. I think we did that in 1992, I believe. Okay. Um, and uh, that was the feature film. And then the Geronimo on TV was uh, TNT. I don't know who did that one. Okay, okay. But yeah, this one was a feature film. And of course, like I say, uh, I worked with um, Walter Hill, who was really a good director. Okay, okay. But that was quite a while back. Okay. Now, when you've been filming a lot of these westerns, is it, is it a lot of the, the on-set location filming? Isn't it uh, that really hard filming to do, like when you have to contend with the weather and everything? Yeah, yeah. The, most of what I've done has been um, on location. I've never really did too much work in Los Angeles or, you know, around Los Angeles, whether it be North Hollywood or or Hollywood. Um, like the feature films, I always have the money to uh, uh, film on location somewhere because they want it more realistic. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, you know, when I do like uh, like a sitcom, uh, they'll do it right there in, in Hollywood. Okay, okay. Uh, because it saves them money, and they, they have the setups right there already in the studio. Okay. So that's kind of how I, I see that, you know. It's always about saving money and making the most out of what they put in with their money. Okay, okay. Well, okay. Good deal, good deal. Okay. So do you have any, uh, have you been up to anything lately? Do you have any upcoming projects or anything you'd like to tell us about? I haven't worked in about two and a half years. The last one was um, Jingle Dress, and we did that in Minneapolis. Uh, that uh, that one was based on a young girl coming from uh, a tribal nation over there in Minnesota, and she wanted to be a, a Jingle Dress dancer, which was part of our native dance at powwows and you know Native Indian dancing. Okay. And so her family moves to Minneapolis because there's really not uh, uh, no work on the reservation. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to say reservation. I, I like to call uh, our places uh, that we grew up nations. Right, but right. But anyway, um, she, uh, she and her uh, family moved to Minneapolis. And uh, her dad, he uh, went to, he, he had gotten a job over there. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty much based on, you know, uh, how Indians deal with living in a city rather than living where they were raised. And ultimately it comes out that, you know, in the end that she she uh, she does dance, you know, she, and it's a, it's a dream of hers, so it's really a good movie. And the other one is uh, Cherokee Word for Water. And that's based on a true story over there at the Cherokees. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and it was uh, back, I think, in the 80s, where Wilma Mankiller had uh, helped uh, the Native people in the backwoods uh, get running water, because at that point they didn't have running water. Mm -hmm. And it was really a help, uh, heartfelt uh, story. Okay, okay. And, uh, so that was one of the latest ones, and uh, another one was fishing naked, and there was about two, uh, of course, two girls and two guys. Mm -hmm. and it was kind of a more of a hilarious movie. Okay, okay. And uh, that's been, like I say, about two and a half years now. But I've just been up here in Missoula and uh, looking to. Uh, I wanted to take some classes actually over here at the University of Montana. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, just to learn more about film instead of just being in front of the camera. I would like to know more about, you know, what goes on behind the camera. Right. And so something I, you know, I'm going to pursue at some point. All right. All of right. course, I'm not going to give the acting part up. But uh, what's good about here is I can uh, fly pretty cheap from uh, Missoula to Los Angeles and then, you know, uh, fly back, of course, very cheap. So that's the, that's a good part of it. Right, right. That's that, yeah. that, that's re that's really and good. Missoula, yeah, Missoula being a, a college town, our university, uh, it's 
town. It's you know the thing, there's a lot of things that are that happen up here, not only film wise, but uh, you know like on film. But you know you, my wife right now she's at a uh, she's watching ballet over at the university because mm-hmm. she was just a ballet dancer. Mm-hmm. So different things like that, you know. And that's what I like about college towns. You know, there's a lot of uh, diversity and in, um, in the arts. You know. Right. Right. Yeah, that, that's a that, that's that's a good deal because that was actually you answered already answered my follow up question. Uh, uh, if and when you were going to start to get behind the camera and we were going to see that kind of work from you and uh, yeah, and there are people you know that I I run across now and again that have asked me you know am I going to start am I going to start uh, writing myself you know trying to do a story or whether it be true or not. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought of that throughout the years that I've been in the industry. I think it's going on at least 26 years, maybe 27 years. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't gotten to that point, but there's always um, something that comes up in my mind, you know, and I never, I never write it down. So what I thought of doing is just having a, a tape recorder and just, you know, whatever comes into my mind, just. Uh, put it on the tape recorder and listen to it later and then you know that can trigger me into start writing you know and I do want to uh, get into that part you know doing a film you know right or, uh, doing a script and then try to put it on film mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that's kind of uh, something I'm looking towards okay okay and do you all do you partake in any other hobbies of how you spend your time um no I'm I moved up here a year ago, so within this year, I've just been getting acclimated to uh, to Missoula and finding my way around here. I used to live here in 1974. Oh, okay. At the time, I was 12 years old, so that was quite a while back. Okay. And so, as an adult now, you know, I'm just you know, still trying to uh, uh, like you know, find what. Can be useful for me uh, in the film industry, so that's kind of what I've been doing, and I've kind of set uh, uh, per se Hollywood aside, but you know I'm going to really uh, push it uh, this coming spring. Okay, okay. And right. I still have my agent down there in uh, Los Angeles, so okay. And it's a really good agency, so I, you know, like I said, I haven't given that. Uh, part of my life up and that is my life you know I can't see myself um, doing any other job for for the rest of my life I really love film right good deal good deal okay now here's a we're about to be wrapping things up very shortly so here's a one other question where a lot of people wonder just how tall are you because every scene I've ever seen you and you always like tower over everybody well, in stocking feet, I'm five eleven, and shoes, I'm six foot. Oh, okay. And, uh, a lot of people do think I'm, you know, taller than I am. And when I go back home, there's a lot of young black feet boys that are. <clears throat> nowadays, I see them ranging from anywhere from six five to six nine. Oh. And uh, when I go back home, they say, "I thought you were taller than that." <laughs> Okay. Okay. It's kind of crazy, you know. People just tend to think that I'm taller. Yeah, and and like, and here's a, and here's a final question uh, before we wrap things up. Uh, again, it's kind of a fun question. Uh, because of like, you know, in in Fargo, like you're bigger than everybody in there. Did you like used to like play football or wrestle or box or do something like that? Um. Well, when I was in high school, I played uh, basketball. Okay. I weighed uh, anywhere between 165 pounds to 170. Oh, okay. And once I had gotten in the film, I uh, start working out, and uh, people thought I worked out most of my life, and that's where I started getting bulky. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I I got up to like 205, but I was never into you know uh, weightlifting. Okay. And the way I look big on Fargo is they put really tight clothes on me <laughs> so it made me look bigger than I was <laughs> okay that's why you know guys ask me were you really you know 
you look very muscular. And I just said, you know, they just put tight clothes on me, made me look bigger. And, you know, of course, for performance, you know, being angry, angry you know, people just kind of assume that a person is a lot bigger than they are or taller than they are. Right, right. Well, you did lift Bashimi pretty effortlessly in the belt with with the belt when. Uh... Oh yeah. Now was... uh, he was a nice guy. He was a very nice guy, Steve Buscemi, and I really liked working with him. A very professional, and uh, and you know you learn off of actors that have been in there for years and have have done a lot of work, uh, and so I always learn from uh, people like that, like Steve Buscemi and other big actors. So. Right, right. And that's how I, I've really kind of come to a point in my life that I've been able to work more than others because I, I study. When I'm watching a film, I'm usually studying the film instead of just enjoying it. Okay, okay. All righty. Well, all right. Well, we're, we're about out of time, Steve. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I'd like to have you on again for a follow-up interview down the road, and I wish you well in your endeavors. Day now. You too now. I'll talk to you later. And I'll be looking forward to your call. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye now. <laughs> bye. All right, and there you have it, everybody. Steve Rivas. What a great guy. Very interesting to talk to. Has a lot of insight on a lot of things. You know, he could be getting behind the camera, and, you know, we could just see a whole new part of his career from that. And I look forward to that. So I thank you, Steve, for. Uh, uh, you know, coming on my podcast. I thank to everybody who I reached out to who helped make this possible. And uh, I will be back next time with another CG radio interview, everybody. Stay safe out there.